think he's tipping us. <laughs> Take your Bibles and turn I to no Luke chapter gods, 12. No other gods. I know. I know. I haven't been to Chihuahua in hell. And and I'll tell you, you need to try it. I, I don't like going there either. And my, my, I will say this. It's the best dessert I've had in a long time, I can tell you. And, and we have ladies up there cooking all these things. And um, you got to try it. That's all, all I can say here is uh, give it a shot. It's a lot of fun, but uh, it's also uh, uh, not good for the waistline, that's for sure. We've, been, we've given the message a title. We're going to get right into it today in Luke chapter 12. We'll begin reading in verse 8. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And I believe that as crazy as this is going to sound, uh, this is going to be an uplifting message. Because of the way that Christ presents it. And as I was mentioned to the Bible study crew today, that I... Uh, had preached on this several times, so I really enthralled myself this week in the um, Bible study lesson in Exodus 20, and was uh, really not getting into this message until Wednesday, and pulling it apart, and I kind of wish I had gotten into it sooner, because I'm going to present it in a way that I've never preached before, and it makes sense, because we've been going through Luke, and we've been staying in the context of the chapters. And this conversation that the Lord is in, in verse 8, is a continuation from the Pharisee's house that spills out into the streets. And it's going to sound, especially in the next couple of weeks, very similar to the Sermon on the Mount. But the Sermon on the Mount was in Galilee. He is in Jerusalem right now. In the Pharisee's house, he's filled out to the streets. And the Bible says in, in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, that the multitudes were rushing to him on the streets. And it was more than they could count. It was in the thousands. And they were crushing each other to get close to him. That's, think of it like the Beatles. When the Beatles came to America and all this rushing was coming down, that's what was happening. However, you know what happens to crowds when they're in favor of something, they're screaming, a mob like that, they can flip so fast. And believe me, that's what's going to happen because the Pharisees, as you know, will win the day eventually and turn those crowds against Jesus Christ. And it's just heartbreaking, okay? Um, Luke chapter 12, verse number 8, we'll begin reading this morning. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the son of man, no, and notice the top formal of that title. That's a very Old Testament title. Also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Now I want to contrast before we get into this message of verse 8 and verse 9. He says, the son of man, whoever acknowledges him. And then he says in verse 9, I am who the Son of Man is. This goes right to Daniel and the Old Testament prophecies. And you deny me, and you will be denied before the angels of God. So he's telling them right off the bat he's God in that crowded area. Verse number 10. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. That is typically, traditionally called the unpardonable sin. Verse 11. And when they bring you before synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious. Don't worry about what you will say and defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So it's not what you should. You don't have to worry about it, but it'll be what he gives you, what you will say, what you ought to say. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful for the reading of this sobering passage. But for those of us who acknowledge you in our lives, we see the promise of being acknowledged up in the throne room of heaven. 
when the great day comes. That day. That is all spoken about in the Old Testament and the New. When we appear before God face to face. And so Lord, I pray that we will get a better understanding of this doctrine. It's a teaching that has been so misaligned in so many different areas. And Lord, we want to be very careful with the text and the context and the understanding of what this means so that we can get a grasp just ever so lightly, but yet, Lord, just something that we can hold on to and take with us on what you meant on that dusty street that day in Jerusalem. We pray this now in your precious son's name. Lord, we pray for those who are hurting. We especially think of this man named Bruce, who is in the hospital now and needs your direct intervention. And we're asking that for, Lord, not only him, but we also pray for others that we have brought forth in our time of prayer this morning in the, in the hope and belief that Jesus Christ will get the honor and glory in each and every situation. And we pray that in your precious name. Amen and amen. Luke chapter 12, verses 8 to 10 is the section of the unpardonable sin. Now, I will tell you, it's repeated in Mark chapter 6 and Mark chapter 3, verse 28 and Matthew chapter 12 in verse 31. So three times in the New Testament, it is mentioned as a sin that cannot be forgiven. So it gets the title and the Matthew passage, I believe, is where it says it's unpardonable. It will not be pardoned. It will not be forgiven. And I work, as you know, with a lot of seniors in ministry. And I've noticed, especially in the last 15 years, that when, as people who have been believers all their life, Christians that have faithfully followed the Lord, as they get older, and let's be honest, we all are feeling this, we get more feeble, they begin to come to me and question two things. One, about their salvation. And sometimes it could be because of mental health, but typically it's because of a life that's been lived for a long time. Was it real? And then the second thing they were questioning, and I had this just as recently as a couple of weeks ago, have I committed the unpardonable sin? And the reason they make that is because they look at their life and we are all very sinful creatures. As we were just in the first commandment of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 verse 3, we know we fail God in the impurity of our worship. We're so distracted. And that's the first thing that we should be is totally focused. You can't do it 24-7. But you can blot out for the most part of your day, your waking hours, the distractions, and as a result, have a focus that's more heart-centered to God and worship, and having no other gods before them. But that question comes up more than it should, have I committed the impartable sin? Now, I can say that the young don't focus that way on it. Because if you think about it, their life has not been lived as much. And there's a degree, even up to 20 years old, of a form of innocence as they start to go into more sinful activities away from their families. Normal families is what I really should be alluding to here. We're not talking about those that have extreme difficulties with the people who have been over them in their, in their lives. But to be honest, it's not something, I've got to be honest with you, that I don't necessarily fret with. And I think there's a reason for that, and I'm going to just kind of give it to you in human terms before we look at the scriptures. And you may be able to relate to this, you may not. I was not raised in a Christian home. In fact, it was very much the opposite. It was a very worldly home. And that type of, of mindset in the home drove me more to Christ because of the sin and problems that were going on. And so as a result, when I got saved, I really thought for the last two or three years of my life, I had been trying to live a life that would be respectable. And I did get that from my family members, but also thinking that I was honoring God. And so I was working for my salvation. 
And then when the first time in my life at 16 years old, I heard that it is just the opposite of what I thought. You cannot work for your salvation. You cannot be good enough. If you sin one time, you deserve hell's hottest flame. And so as a result of that, when I realized it was not my works, not my righteousness, the very first time I heard the gospel clearly, I got saved on March the 10th, 1973. There was no arguing with me. That I know for a fact that the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to go old King James here for a minute, smitten my heart. It broke me. Because I thought I was doing what I was required to be doing. I'd been baptized. When I was six, I went forward in this church. It was a very stained glass type church. There were thousands of people there. I thought that's what washed my sins away. I didn't smoke. I didn't chew. I didn't run with girls who do. So that's how it was. I was being good. There was something in my nature. But that can lead you to Phariseeism. And if had not got the clear message at a young age, Conviction may have been harder because I would have been more set and more stiff-necked and more of a problematic situation. But that night, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and there was no doubt because of the conviction that was happening. It wasn't something that was guilt. It was something I realized I was wrong, and I had to change my direction. So for me, it was not difficult. But for some who have had more of a semblance of Christianity in their young lives, they start to grow up. They begin to feel that it wasn't as dramatic. And as a result, they go into areas of sin. They go into areas of the way of the world. And the lapses happen. And did I commit the unpardonable sin? I can surely understand that. But it's not something that we should be focused on. Now, to give some context to this, we'll look at the chapter as a whole. But I want, before we go in, to give a better understanding. I'll give you the answer to this right away. And it's John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus speaking to the disciples here in the disciples' messages, okay? It is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper, which is the Holy Spirit, the comforter, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now notice verse 8. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. That's what happened to me that night, okay? The conviction of the Holy Spirit came into me when I realized I was not as good as I thought I was. And in verse 10, it says, concerning righteousness, because I go to my Father and you will see me no more. I knew that I was not righteousness and that the break of the Father was never there. Now, I will say this, just so you can, I could have been at that young age at 16 years old, there is still a degree of innocence, and you can be S-A-F-E for a period of time because I was not raised in a Christian home. I couldn't even tell you where Genesis was. In fact, when I went to Bible college, I had a hard time finding it. <laughs> but I knew this, that in my mind, I was trying to score points with God, even though I wasn't in church. So righteousness came in, and I realized he is righteous and I'm not. Now look at verse 11. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Let me tell you what that meant for me. When that young man gave me the personal testimony of witness, when it was just he and I on that Friday night at 7 o'clock, it's pouring down raining. My ride to go home, I didn't have, have my license at that time. I didn't have a vehicle at that time, I should say. We're honking the horn. The conviction of the Holy Spirit hit me, and I realized that, it was his righteousness, and I was being judged right there. They're honking the horn. I didn't even care because I'd heard something I'd never heard before, and it was the gospel. And that all I had to do was repent of my sins and put my faith in the one who had completed God's law and made me whole. And if I would do that before I got out in that car and got, got going down the road, I could be gloriously saved. And it was childlike faith. I believed at that moment. And so the judgment that was on me was removed. Now notice verse 12. 
I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are. He is giving us the clear path of understanding your salvation, and it must be by the Holy Spirit. So, when we look at verse number 10 here of Luke 12, whoever speaks a word of the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever uh, speaks about the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. That's what we think of as the Holy Spirit. We think of it as the form of unbelief. Now, here's where I'm going to change on you, because I've preached this message for years. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is unbelief. But that's not, it's part of it, but it's not all of it. And there's so much more to this that we don't understand. What it, in a nutshell, just to give it to you so you can get it, a quick grasp of it as we look at it a little bit further, but just to kind of hold on, get a nugget here, get a gem. The Holy Spirit and unbelief, the Holy Spirit brings salvation to you, which is true, but here's what you have to understand. It was, it's all the Holy Spirit and it's none of us. It is none of us. It is totally a work of God that grabs hold of you and breaks you and as a result brings you into a born again relationship. That's what I hope you see here today is that in the process of your salvation, even if you were very young, the conviction had to come to your heart and it wasn't for the guilt of your sin as much as it was the Holy Spirit coming in with his purity and his righteousness and then the, then the judgment fell upon you and you realized it. If you don't see those things in your life and you haven't recognized that at any point in your life, I'm not saying just right at that moment, then according to the Bible, you can't be saved. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He brings us that conviction. Now Luke chapter 11 kind of starts this whole thing in the area of the context of it. Luke 11, this casting out the demon that the Lord did, they blame him. Look at verse number 15 and said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. He's doing a work of the spirit and he got blamed about an underground spirit. So that's what preferenced this whole conversation of false teaching was they were saying he was doing the work of Satan. And then it says here, if you'll notice this, in this process that the proof text of chapter 12 and the unpardonable sin is you're going to see Jesus is going to give them the Father, he's going to give them the Son, and then lastly he's going to give them the Holy Spirit. So it begins in chapter 11 with you're Satan, you're Beelzebub, but then as a result he's going to take them to what we know as our cardinal doctrine of the Trinity. And it's got to be all three personalities of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in your salvation. The authority of the Father in verse number 5 of chapter 12. The saving of the Son, He is our Redeemer. And then literally the leading of the Holy Spirit who takes us and brings us to that conviction. And that's what the Spirit does. And so He's going to bring that all out in that chapter. And I waited till this message having known this for weeks, that this is what this is about. And it changed me. And part of the reason why I didn't study as hard this week was I waited a little bit later was because I've been waiting to give this to you. The authority of the Father, the saving of the Son. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. And I'll just read it to you so you'll see this here in chapter 12. We'll not put it up on screen. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, will also acknowledge before the angels of God. He is saying, not only am I God, I'm the one who will make that decision because of that. But if you don't acknowledge me, you, you will be lost. But you, you can be forgiven at some time in your life by acknowledging. You, you, can, you can blaspheme the Son. You can blaspheme the Father. But you cannot blaspheme the work of the Holy Spirit. That's unpardonable. And that's what he's saying is that the Father can be mentioned. Paul is the greatest example. He blasphemed all the works of God in two-thirds of the Trinity when he was thought he was doing the work of the Father 
and, and trying to provide Old Testament theology that was anti-Christ. And he would kill Christians as a result of it. Then, if they said they were part of the way, Christos, little Christ, he would imprison them. So he blasphemed the Father, he blasphemed the Son, but never did he have that understanding that it was a work of the Holy Spirit that was in the heart and not the work of man trying to perform the obeying of the commandments. And that's what was enabling him. If you live that life to where you say it must be me doing this and not the Spirit, not the whole Godhead of the Trinity, then you are bound for hell. And so many people want to attach these things to it. There are very few churches who will not attach some work to it, to some degree. I'm not saying all those people in those churches are lost in those denominations in the Christian world, but there are many of them who want to tag along. You made it to Bible study today, that's great. That doesn't score anything as far as heaven is concerned. We could quote the whole Bible, like we were talking about earlier, that we, there are people who are able to do that. That doesn't mean a thing. You can quote the whole Bible and still be lost and go to hell. It has to be a work of the Holy Spirit and giving you that grace into your life that brings to you that righteousness and that judgment and that sense of conviction. If it doesn't happen, then yes. Yeah. And so it is more than just saying not believing. And by the way, it's not suicide either. The Catholics teach that. You commit suicide, you commit the unpardonable sin. That's not true. It's murder. It's not good. You shouldn't do it. But that's not the sin that will send you to hell. That's the thing that we have to understand. To get a better understanding, to really give you a grasp on this, and I hope you'll see this here, because you have to play on chapter 12 with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit a little bit on your own. We won't have time in the message today, and we'll have to go on. It's the longest chapter in Luke, by the way. So there's that. But to give you an understanding, is I want you to think about how a baby is brought to life at conception. They now have photos that when the seed of man touches the embryo and goes inside and makes that penetration, there's a flash of light. Split second. It's been recorded. This isn't fake pseudoscience. This is real. And that's what happens to the believer once the Holy Spirit penetrates the soul. That light comes on. At James's funeral, we played the song written by Hank Williams. James would always talk about that. I said, James, I don't want to hear about Hank Williams. I want to hear about James. I would say that. I want to hear about Elvis. I want to hear about James. But we played. We had an audio recording of I Saw the Light. And he played that song, and everybody smiled and applauded. And it was such a blessing because there was a time in James' life when there was, now get this, a conception, just like what happened to me. you got to put it in Mary's context. Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God to have a child. She didn't say, I did it. All these people going around saying, oh, a woman can do both now, or a man can have a baby. They're crazy, aren't they? Mary didn't say that. Here's what Mary did. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, before they had sex, She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. How amazing is that? But as he considered these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For what? For that which is conceived in her is from the Lord. When you claim Christ as Lord and Savior, a conception of the Holy Spirit came into you, and you can't commit the unpardonable sin. 
what was done physically here to Mary in the immaculate conception was done spiritually for us. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. What is this? What are we talking about? It's the most simplest thing to understand is John 3, 5, 7. John 3 says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you're born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Now notice verse 5 and verse 6. It contrasts this. Stay with me here. When a mother is about to go into labor, something happens. What breaks? Her water. That which is, this is not baptism. Oh, many have taught that. You got to get baptized. That's the physical aspect of it. You got to get then the spirit. No, it's the physical aspect of birth with conception. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, you got to be born in this world to get saved eventually. We're born lost, actually. But then we get saved. That's the, that's the birth of flesh. That's verse 6. That which is flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said of you, you must be born again. How amazing. What a wonderful, wonderful truth by the Word of God. If you recognize the authority of the Father and you know that the Son is saving you, then you have no problem with the conception, the leading impulse of the Spirit that was able to make you born again. We are born again by the Spirit that leads you to this. It's so great. In John 16, verse 13, the passage we just read says, The Spirit will lead you into all truth. He is the guide. He is the comforter. He is the one who teaches us. He reveals these things to us. That's why we showed the utmost respect to the third member of the Trinity. He brings these things to us. Jesus told the woman at the well at Sychar in Samaria, a Samaritan, you don't know what you're worshiping because they that worship God will worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He leads us into this. So we get that understanding. Now, people who just think that the Holy Spirit is a tool to be used for their works, that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And there are churches after churches after churches who demand that and want to see that performance from you, which is nothing more than a work of the flesh. I don't care how many people we feed. I don't care how many times we go to the hospital. I don't care how much we give to a charity and we sell the Holy Spirit's leading to us. If we're putting that to attributes of our salvation, we were never conceived by the Spirit. We do these things because He has done this to us. It doesn't get us any righteousness with God. And so the power of the Spirit of God comes into us and compels us to do these things doesn't bring us to the point to where we think we have to. And it's never been that way. That's the beauty of the church. Every single person here is here because you want to. We said in Bible study, it's hard to get up and come to church, isn't it? It's really hard. I had to beat myself. Now, you know what's so funny? I have more difficulty on Sunday when to be here than I do on Monday being at work. Why is that? You know why it is. Because I've got a rural taskmaster who says, you don't show up here on Monday, look out. You may not have a job. You see what I'm saying? That's how people put God in their categories. They do the same thing. And I was doing that as a young man. But God is so much more of the spirit and not of the flesh. That's the picture. Isn't these great pictures, by the way? Don't we think of that? Look at Mary as the example. Mary did nothing. She was just the vessel. All she did was be the conduit of it. When I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that's all I was the conduit. The Spirit did it all. How beautiful. How wonderful is it? And then we have the picture, literally, of what it means that, yes, we come here to worship as a church, but we know these walls, this building, if we were to go out and meet in the field and love each other and, and have the same spirit we have, that's the conception of the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with it. 
I, I thought about often a lot what we could do with Capstone Baptist. You know, we just sang Lulu's much. Well, we could put some grand things there. We get some stained glass, okay? And I'm sure Susan and Operation Liberty will look at it and go, you know, they spent a lot of money on stained glass. I was in one church, the stained glass for each frame, there were 12 frames for disciples were $90,000 in the 80s. Not joking. Got to be in that church for a couple of weeks. Guess what? Then we get an organ here. And we start getting this big pipe thing. And people would come out to see that big pipe thing, right? And then look at our stained glass. And that, I was in one church. In 1979, they had just bought a million dollar organ. They took all day Sunday, didn't have any preaching, canceled Sunday school, and played the organ from 9 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock at night. Nothing but more to, to show off those pipes. For a million dollars. The stained glass is still in that church in North Carolina. The church in Dallas got rid of that organ probably 10, 15 years ago. A million dollars in 1979. I was in a church one time. They took the platform and raised it up so high and they made it all these stone pillars that when the pastor got out of it, he was so high above there and he was looking at it and it cost not millions but thousands and thousands of dollars so that he could be exalted and put into which I can tell you I'm making this up, but that's how they did it back then. And they did that, and they just thought they were so close to God by doing that. God's messenger was up 40 feet in the air. He had to be closer to God than I am. All that is crazy. I kind of like stained glass. i got to be honest. With the organ I can do a little bit of. I always think of the ball games with the organ. But stained glass is beautiful, but not for $90,000 a frame. Just because it had the disciples on it. Stop it. It's of the flesh. It's not homosexuality that's the unpardonable sin. It's not our abortionists that are going around the country that's the unpardonable sin. I know we'd like to think of it. But it is simply attributing what we would say would be should be works of grace being put in the area of the flesh and claiming that's the Holy Spirit. I, I can't prove. Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says that the Spirit of God brings us into the adoption of the family. Verse 18, and it says, therefore we can cry, Abba, Father. We still recognize him as Father, but we are adopted into his family, co-equal with the Son, as a result of he is our Messiah that saved us, and he's the firstborn, but the personal work of the Holy Spirit enabled us to call him Daddy. That's the beauty of this. You're brought into the family. You know, you, this passage you know in Romans 8, verse 26, where it says that the Holy Spirit will speak for you in tongues you can't even speak. You know, some people think that's supposed to be stuff that's going on in the world today. Romans 8, verse 26. That's not that. You know what that is? That means he intercedes and says, I bore that soul, and now it is in the fellowship of the Trinity of God. He prays deep personal prayers for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says he seals us with, his, with the promise of the Holy Spirit. We're guaranteed that. God seals us into our spiritual birth, and you can't lose it. I love what Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 says. Zechariah says, it's not by my might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It is the spirit that brings this conception of salvation to you and I. It cannot be attributed to any work of Satan. It cannot be attributed to any work of the flesh. It cannot be attributed to any work of the world. We live in the Spirit. Romans 4, 1 says, we walk in the Spirit. And as a result, our work becomes in the Spirit. That's what happens, and it brings us access into this Trinity. That's what Luke chapter 12 is all about here. 
And the amazing thing is, it's been put forth as such a scary thing by churches through the centuries. Now, I will give you something scary. I, I can't just not. This does scare me. I want you to know. Hebrews chapter 10, when, 10, 10, when we reject the Holy Spirit's offering, here's what happens. For if we go on sinning deliberately after we receive the knowledge of the truth, the previous verses talk about having a taste of it, a taste of the truth in, in, in earlier chapters that there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. See, there it is, Pastor Bobby. You sinned and you go to hell. No, read on. But a fearful expectation of judgment and the fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. That is scary, isn't it? Anyone who sets aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. In other words, you broke the commandments. You had to have two or three witnesses. But... The witness of the Father, the witness of the Son, rejecting the Spirit, gives you this. And I want you to look at verse number 29. How much worse punishment do we think, do you think, will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has proclaimed the blood of the covenant? There's your trinity right there. The Father established the covenant. The Son was the sacrifice and has by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. That's how this happens. The spirit of grace was offered to you and you rejected it. As a result, you trampled the blood of, of, the, of, of Christ and you literally took the covenant of God the Father and trashed it. The sacrifice that was provided by Jesus and the covenant that the Father put forth. And it was the Spirit who offered it to you. That's the unpardonable sin right there. That's the one who goes around thinking that they're saved, and then all of a sudden they realize they were trusting themselves. <clears throat> That's why the verse of the last part of this passage says this: "For we know Him who said, 'Vengeance is mine; I will repay again.' The Lord will judge His people." How powerful is that? Now I want you to realize this. That's the roughest part of this. But we don't have to worry about it because Luke 12, verse 11 said, here's your out. You take the blood of the covenant and you honor that with Christ's sacrifice and the Father establishing the covenant and you honor the Spirit and you do not grieve him or quench him. Notice verse 11 of Luke chapter 12. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about whether you should defend yourself or what you would say. For the Holy Spirit will do what? You don't have to worry about anything. He's going to guide you. That word teach means he's going to lead you through whatever persecution you may see. We don't see much in this country, but we need to recognize that when persecution comes, it better be the Holy Spirit leading us. Because our relationship with him means we're to be filled with him. And he will give you what you should say. How amazing is that? That should take all fear away. I even say even the fear of my grandchildren of what's going to happen in the days to come. Because I'm going to entrust the Holy Spirit of God. And I have sinned in that way. Where I haven't trampled or I haven't uh, profaned the covenant. And I surely have not disappointed the Holy Spirit. But I've been thinking in my own mind what's going to happen to kids. I'm going to give that over to my leader, the revealer, the Holy Spirit. And he's going to, I'm going to trust him to take care of them. After I'm dead and gone. And if the Lord tarries. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour. I am trusting him with my children and my grandchildren. And that's what I'm asking for you to do. Bring that over to the area of the good news and simply let God be God. Now, I'll tell you what the thing you're going to fight. I want you all to listen to me as I close this message out. You're going to fight your failings. It's going to happen. This right here gets thinner. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I scratch it. Boy, it's a mess. I bruise easier now. It stays with me. I have all these issues. Even my carbuncles have carbuncles. The problems we have with age, 
on the flesh is nothing compared to what we will have inside if we're not letting the teacher, the leader, the comforter, the flame of holy conviction fire, that's our spirit, the Holy Spirit, engulf us and keep us filled. A few weeks ago, I told you that you and I may be seeing those, those days come. Are we going to be ready for it? Can we be ready for it? We won't be unless we're filled with God's Spirit. Go back to your conception and remember that because when you were conceived and born again, that's where it starts. And then you begin to build up and you begin to apply the things of God in your life and he will help you in the hour of temptation. I promise you. Our Father, we're thankful for this time. Lord, we know that so many people who are in churches today are fearful of what these unbelievable passages, very tough passages on the surface, think that they could have been committed to be a part of the sin when Lord would simply just not allow them the Spirit to fill them, to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit. I pray that you'll help us, Lord, as we struggle with these things. Lord, we all do. We're human. But we're not blaspheming the Holy Spirit because we've been conceived by the Holy Spirit. We're born again. So may that assurance be given to each and every one of us. Lord, if it's somehow been bypassed, and Lord, that we never truly trusted you in faith and didn't have the Spirit lead us, then, Lord, I pray that will be revealed to us in short order for anyone in this room or anyone within the sound of my voice. I pray, Father, that they will understand that it is by the Spirit that we get this assurance. Lord, we could take the time to go into 1 John that speaks so much about the Spirit's moving in our hearts and lives. May that become a mantra for us as Christians in these dark and evil days. We are being led by your spirit. It is not your might. It is not the uh, chariots. It is not horses. It is your spirit. So I pray, Father, we'll understand that. But Lord, I also help us to remember that little is much when you're in it. And you can take this place and the miracle of salvation can come to many as a result of the efforts of this church here. We just pray and band together. And ask your spirit to do his work in the hearts of the children you're going to claim. Lord, we're not worried about persecution. May we be like the disciples and count it all joy to suffer. May we have that spirit that truly, truly profounds a lost and dying world. And that we might be the witness that you've called us to be. I thank you for each one that's here today. I pray that you will bless them and that you will encourage them by the Spirit of God to go forth and to go boldly. And I ask that in your precious Son's name. Amen and amen. I believe every word I've said today, I really do. And it's just the deep, deep things of God that I've been so missing in so many areas of my life. I can tell you that in preaching this message, it was always just a sin of unbelief, and that's it. And so much more. Go forth with God. May we all surrender to his spirit. Amen. 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 Amen.